I should introduce my colleague, Jake Emerson, who's also on the call. Uh, together, Jake and I work on a project called BioConnect. And so um, we're gonna be we're gonna be talking about BioConnect. That's the the app that we're developing um, that we're using Arrowcrate as part of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and share. I may uh, struggle a bit with getting the right presentation mode, so just bear with me for a moment. All right, can you see the presentation view? Yeah. Good. All right, so uh, I'm Abigail Miller. Uh, I think I, most of you have met me before on previous uh, previous call. Uh, I'm a software engineer at the Jackson Laboratory and I work in the computational sciences department. And as I mentioned, uh, Jake and I are working on this uh, software app called BioConnect. Uh, BioConnect has a lot of pieces and there are a lot of uh, technical details. I could talk about it all day, but I'm gonna try to keep myself focused on, on the relevant topics to this group, which is really the, the data packages. But I'm, I'm gonna give a little bit of background to give you some context on uh, what, what our users' needs are, um, what is involved in generating a data package, why do we need them and so forth. Um, so BioConnect itself is basically one big index of metadata, and um, it's always a little bit surprising to us that we don't already have something like this at the Jackson Laboratory. Um, we've got a number of labs all um, conducting experiments, generating data constantly, and there's no central repository for a researcher to, to search through what data are available. Um, so this is a a big complicated project. Uh, we're still in the early stages of it. We went through um, a first round where we did a lot of proof of concept and R&D work. Um, and at this point, we've got, we've got an application built. It's not complete and it's not been deployed to production, but we've worked through a lot of the, the architecture and technical issues. Um, we have a pretty good foundation to, to build on. Um, and so the, the parts of BioConnect that are relevant here are um, the fact that it is a repository for metadata and it will allow users to search over the metadata, create a set of results um, and export those. And the, the primary goal really for the, for the search and export is so that they can conduct analysis. And these are, if you're not familiar with Jackson Lab, um, most of these experiments are using animal models. So a lot of our data um, are based on animal experiments, um, samples deriving from animals. Uh, and the, the sources of the data are gonna be like laboratory information management systems. Uh, we have a number of machine generated data files and those can be quite large. And then we have manually data, created data files and lots and lots of spreadsheets. And none of them are in a consistent format, as you can imagine. Um, and so this, this uh, thank you, Jake, for this diagram. This is a simple uh, view of our, of our data flow without referencing any specific technologies. So we have the metadata acquisition. Um, there are a number of different sources of the metadata. Uh, right now, at this point in our development, there's quite a bit of manual data curation for existing studies. Um, so I'll talk about how ISA fits into that in a moment, but ideally long term, these metadata will be acquired in an automated way. Um, once we've acquired the metadata, we allow the users to curate them, perform QA analysis on them. And then we end up with uh, a refined set of curated metadata that can be searched. And those are the metadata that will end up in the data packages. And then ideally, 
the data packages will be fed into some sort of analysis tool. So the software itself, I'll just really briefly talk about it. We've got a, an Angular-based front end. Um, we're using a micro front end architecture, which really that means that we're supporting sort of a plug-in framework. So we have a number of small standalone applications and then a portal uh, that hosts the individual applications. And then our back end is a Postgres database. Um, and we use the Django REST framework for our API. We will probably end up with uh, Elasticsearch as well as part of our architecture when we start acquiring massive amounts of data and need to support really fast searches. So that uh, backend architecture will be extended at some point. And if you guys have questions, just jump in and interrupt me. So our metadata, um, I just pulled out a few of the main concepts that are important to our users. So at the study level, the study level is fairly simple. It's a, it's a container for experiments. And at that level, we record things like the, the purpose of the study, um, the study factors, the people, the PIs and curators, and then any relevant publications. And then the assays, that's where all the good stuff is. That's where we have our definition of the process sequence and the data files. And then associated with both studies and assays are materials. And for us, those materials are primarily animals and samples. Um, we do have some studies in the system that were conducted externally that have human subjects, but for the most part, our materials are animals and samples. And it's really important for us and our users that we track and be able to search by animal and sample characteristics. And these may vary from species to species or sample type to sample type, but our users have got to be able to search on things like the species and the strain, um, tissue type. So those are, those are very important to us. So we need to have a good structure for those that are searchable, but also flexible. So we landed on the ISA standard for our metadata schema. Um, we had originally, we went through a couple iterations of, of means to, to store our metadata, you know, going from something that's totally homegrown and hard-coded to something that was totally dynamic. Um, and at some point we realized that we needed to adopt a, a community standard. Um, and ISA, which stands for Investigation Study Assay, was a really good fit for us. Um, it's the, the schema itself fits our studies and it's fairly simple for people to understand and we can also extend it. So like those characteristics I was just talking about, um, those are accommodated within this ISA model. There's also a number of, of tools that we can use. Um, Yeah, so, so we actually, we're using, their, there's a community around ISA, which is great. We get a lot of, of examples and, um, and uh, there are a number of tools that we can use. We're actually using right now the ISA API Python library. Um, I mentioned that a lot of our existing study data is being manually curated and that's being manually curated in an ISA tab format. So we can use the, the ISA, uh, Python API to load those tab files into our database. So we've been really happy with this. Um, it also, uh, I'll talk more about this, but it also fits really nicely with the RO crates data packages. Um, I just pulled out some kind of random examples of what our metadata look like. Um, these are some typical ontology annotations. That, Almost everything in the ISA model can be annotated with an ontology term. So we, um, an ontology term consists of the, the term text itself, an ontology source, and then an accession ID. And I think I mentioned that materials are important. Uh, we've got samples attached to an assay and the samples have a source. So it's important to be able to, to trace a source, a, a sample back to its source. So 
If it's a blood sample, we need to track it to the animal it came from. And then this would be an example of one of our process flows. Um, we have uh, possibly a sample extraction to start, uh, and then a nucleic acid extraction, and then we run sequencing on it. And so each one of these process steps has inputs and outputs um, and, and possibly data files. And the data file could be raw or processed. So all of these types of metadata have to be captured and have to travel along with the data files that people export. Um, so getting to the export itself, which is where our crate comes in, um, the goal is for the users to find data that are relevant to what they're interested in. They need to be able to do a faceted search, um, a flexible faceted search. Um, and the goal is to find the data files and package them up and export them. It has to be easy. Um, and they also need to be able to go to a specific study, for example, and download everything for that study. That's also a common scenario. Um, and the package has to be human readable and machine readable. We need to be able to build tools um, that can parse out the, the packages and uh, take actions on them. Our packages uh, may or may not include the actual data files, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, so, so the number of challenges with the, with the whole data package uh, generation and export, these are a few of them. Uh, we really needed a format that was uh, predictable, but not too cumbersome for people to work with. So finding that balance was really important. Um, I mentioned that a package may or not, may not include the data files. Um, this was one of our big challenges and continues to be to this day. Um, you know, a, a set of files that are in a package could be uh, one meg, they could be three gigs. And we, we don't want to, to generate a package that's so large that it's prohibitive to download. Um, so finding a mechanism for, for including files um, without generating a package that's too large for download is a big challenge for us. We ended up, right now what we're doing is including any file that's under 10 megabytes. But if you have a thousand of those, you can still produce a pretty large data package. Um, so still some challenges there to work out. And then finding a, an efficient way to structure the metadata was, was hard for us. Um, we went through a couple rounds of, of just R&D to try to figure out the, the most efficient way to structure the data. You know, and for, for us, we could have a group of animals, for example, that are associated with multiple studies. So if somebody generates a, a data package with multiple studies, the animal metadata could possibly be repeated you know, for each study. Um, and then another one that we, we touched on at the last call is the file type definitions. It's, it's very important for us and provides a lot of power for our system if the user is able to understand the format of the data files that they export. Um, we have so many different types of spreadsheets and machine generated files. It's almost impossible to know if you, if you download a file and the column headers um, aren't uh, phrases or sentences that explain what they are, uh, you have no way of knowing what you're looking at. And a lot of these machine generated files um, have very cryptic column headers. Um, so, so you know, if you, if you download multiple files, the column headers are cryptic. You can't actually take the data from one file and integrate it with the data from another file because you don't know what matches, you don't know what you're looking at. So um, that was a big part of our goals and our architecture is to represent uh, file types. So here again, we landed on a community standard and we uh, are using the frictionless framework. We're, we're not leveraging the whole, the whole power of the frictionless framework, but there's parts of it that um, work very well for us and our needs. So we're, we're using um, 
the basic uh, schema for de defining a file type. And that is uh, the JSON format. I've got some examples right here. The text might be a little small, um, but they specify there's a there's a specification for how to define the contents of a file. And each column in the file is represented with a field descriptor. The field descriptor is going to have um, the ID, the column header ID, but also a name and a description, which is very helpful. And what they call an RDF type, which is going to be a pointer to an ontology term. And that's where, you know, potentially we have we have some very powerful tools that we can build on because now I can take something called animal weight from one file and something called body weight from another file. And I know that they're the same thing because they've got the same RDF type and I can map them now. So when we first started out, uh, we went through a uh, proof of concept period with the, the package generation. We um, it was mostly just to kind of explore our use cases and just explore what we could do with our with our metadata. So we originally built a custom package format, and it consisted of a README, a metadata JSON file, um, a file map that contained the, the machine readable path through the metadata to each file. And then the field descriptor file was the uh, frictionless file type definitions. And then any any smaller file was actually the physical file was included. Um, this worked just fine, but we and it was mostly mostly a learning process for us. Uh, but we really wanted to to follow a standard with this part of the architecture as well. And this is where we landed on RO crates, um, much like ISA and frictionless. It was a great fit for us and had a community and support and tools uh, that we could tap into. So that made a lot of sense for us to move to that. And luckily, um, thanks to Jake's design of the original custom package format, um, it really wasn't a huge lift to migrate to RO crates because the way that our original custom packages were structured was very similar to um, RO crate. So we adapted our, our code that generates the package to follow the RO create standard. Yeah, so our, our code is a lot simplified because we can use the, the Python library <clears throat> to generate the crates. And there are a number of other advantages over our custom solution. We really like the JSON LD um, and the, the separating of the data uh, entities from the context entities. And it has better support for data provenance that we had in our custom solution. Um, so for, for a, a BioConnect RO crate package, we've got the standard RO crate properties. Um, I know at least one of these, I think it's the encoding format overlaps with um, frictionless. So we haven't we haven't worked out what we're going to do about that yet. Um, you know, frictionless also has a file format. I think the meaning is is a little bit different, but we don't want to have um, unclear conflicting properties in the metadata file. And then uh, for the ISA entities, um, we wanted to include things like study assay sources and samples include all that ISA metadata in the RO crate. And some of it maps really nicely to the standard RO crate properties. Some of it we needed to extend. And I'd be interested to see if our method for extending those, um, it, see what the group has to say about that, because I'm not sure we did it the correct way. Um, but we haven't gone through the exercise of, of going through the ISA model in detail and trying to map each ISA entity to a schema.org entity. Um, that would probably be a good exercise for somebody at some point. Um, but as of today, we are using extended properties to capture anything from the ISA model that didn't map. Um, and 
my PowerPoint is just about done. Uh, in terms of next steps, I'm sure I missed something here. And Jake, you can jump in if I did. Uh, but I think it would it would help us a lot to develop a profile for BioConnect uh, RO crate packages. That would be fun. Um, we're working on developing some CLI tools for working with packages. We just had a demo of that earlier today. We've got somebody working on that, which is pretty cool. And then uh, building the integration with some of our existing tools. So these would be like the analysis tools uh, for doing things like visualizing um, and aggregating data. So uh, a user should be able to generate a data package in BioConnect and then see all of the tools available um, that can consume that data package. And they should be able to take a data package and feed it into a tool in order to do that analysis. So that's all future work that we're building the, the foundation for right now. So are there any questions on what I just covered? I'm taking a lot of time, so I'm gonna try to go through the next part pretty quickly. That's okay, take your time, Abigail, because it's really interesting. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, uh, Maria has a question. question. Hi. I'm sorry, question? Yeah, yeah. It's a question. Uh, uh, I remember that the uh, one of the slides, I guess, it was uh, the number ten. Uh, the, you were just explaining that, uh, for instance, the you you, you were uh, annotating uh, with ontology terms just uh, each one of the of the attributes or the elements, and uh, I I saw that. Just uh, an example that uh, one of those elements uh, uh, had to use enumerated values. And I was wondering whether you were also uh, modeling uh, enumerated values based on ontologies where those elements uh, are declared, because sometimes it's like uh, it's in this ontology and uh, it's uh, just uh, from this point, uh, it's one of the descendants of uh, this ontology term, for instance. All right, so that's a good question. If I understood correctly, um, it's it's a relevant topic to us right now. We um, we understand that when somebody is curating a study, um, we want to constrain the ontology terms that they use when they're curating, so that we don't have um, a huge wide variety of ontology sources and terms. Uh, so we we built kind of an extension on top of the ISA model. Uh, to, to support controlled, much like controlled vocabularies, they're controlled ontology terms. And so for each uh, part of the ISA model that we're annotating, there will be a set of, you know, a pool of terms that people can select from. And those, there will be a fixed number of sources and a fixed number of terms. Uh -huh. Thank you. Does that, does that answer your question? And, yeah, and I think you've, yeah. cool. And and so like good examples for us are strain. So we just have a huge long list of all the different strains that are available in, in mice. And so they're, you know, it's not an ontology per se, but it's more an, an enumerated list or sex is not one. Like oh, thanks. So Carol knows Carol Bolt, and we just met with her the other day and she was very explicit with us that some of the things we're calling ontologies are not ontologies. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the the famous ontology wars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we fought. Yeah, well, you can't win. <laughs> not, not against Carol. <laughs> <laughs> no, we bow down to Carol. So. We mix them all up. <laughs> ontologies, terminologies, and profile saving you could think of this as a profile for your eyes right because you're restricting so they all are consistent mm -hmm. yes. and that's very important yeah um i was going to show you a few things in the software itself um i'll generate a data package uh there's two ways that a user can do this they can conduct a search and generate a data package based on the search results um, or they can just browse uh the investigation studies and assays. I didn't talk about investigations very much, which is the top level uh, structure in the ISA model. 
we're using it primarily just as a container for study. So uh, an investigation can have one or more studies. Um, and they can they can go in here and view the studies and then generate a data package from from at any level here. So they could generate a data package just from one assay in the study uh, or the entire investigation. So I'll go ahead and do that. If I click this button, I'm going to get a uh, some information and about Abigail. Yeah, I still uh, see just the PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh, we haven't flipped to your demo. I think it's on a different screen, maybe. Okay. Sorry about that. No Let worries. Fix that. Okay, can you see my BioConnect browser? Yeah, yeah, we certainly good. can. Good, good. Okay. So I don't know if this matched what you were envisioning in your imagination when you were looking at my PowerPoint, but this is the, the browse uh, investigations, studies and assays page. And you know, it's just a little button here they can click to generate the package. Um, and they get some summary information, how many files are in it and what the total size is. Um, when I hit generate, this is where in the back end we're, we're using the, the Python library to generate the package. And then uh, we, we've, we've decoupled the generating of the package from the actual downloading of the package. Um, one reason being it could take some time to generate the package depending on how much metadata there are. Um, and then the, the user has a user space where they can view any data packages that they've already generated and here's where they would download them. Um, before before I show you another thing in here, I want to jump over and just show you really quickly what these file types look like. This is where we're using the frictionless, some of the frictionless tools. Um, so ideally, um, most if not all files that are registered in BioConnect would be, would be associated with a file type. Um, even if the, the file the field descriptors and the file contents aren't fully fleshed out, uh, it should at least have some basic information about the things like the format of the, of the file type. And then for, I'm just pulling up a, an animal body weight as an example. Um, there's a list of field descriptors here. This isn't a great example because it's not all filled in, but um, the user is able to, for each component of the file, put a description, uh, indicate a data type, and these are all kind of standard properties of uh, frictionless field descriptor. And then the RDF type is where they would map it to the ontology term. So when, when I generate a data package that includes a body weight file that's associated with this file type, I can expect to get this full definition in my package so that I know what each of these fields means. And so going back to the package that I just generated, I'll go to a detail viewer and I can take uh, any one of these files and look at the, the field descriptors for it. So this is just a, a visual you know, way to explore the contents of the data package and then they can download it as well. Um, So I'll do that. And then the, the other thing, I might have to stop and reshare. Just give me a minute. I just want to show you what our AeroCrate metadata file looks like. All right, so this is, I don't know if this is the, this is what, uh, an example I put together earlier. I don't know if it's uh, the same one that I just generated, but this, this will do in terms of showing you guys what's in here. Um, I mentioned that we're extending the terms to include some of the, the ISA components. Um, and this is where we've done it in the context. We're defining each one of these terms and we've mapped it to um, the specific place in the ISA spec that defines the schema for this thing. 
So uh, this URL defines the schema for an assay. Um, if there is a better way to do this, I'd, I'd be really interested in hearing about it. Um, you know, this, the, the RO crate uh, package generation, as well as the application in general is still very much in development. So um, we'd be happy to take any advice on better ways to, to structure um, our crate files. And so yeah, anything else? Link DICE I would give you an ontology definition of those terms so that might be a better one to use. But it would be the same words you've used, but just different URI. Mm -hmm. So in general, we want to try and link things to human readable pages rather than into a, it's not ideal to link to a JSON file. So if there's, you know, so Stian, has somebody, has somebody else defined, made a, a set of terms for this? I, I couldn't find any, but um, we could we could reach out to Phil and see if he has any thoughts on a better way to link those. Yeah, if you if you don't have a contact to to Isa, you shouldn't be shy to define your own and and create HTML pages for it. I mean that that's how we dare to to do stuff like this. Because then at least you you end up linking to something like uh, Peter is saying that that is readable. But on the other hand, to get started, I would definitely have chosen the same thing. So I I don't think it's it's bad. But yeah, it could be could be slightly better. But I would first reach out to Isa and see if yeah. they have any ambitions in in that direction. Well, they're on the call, Mark. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so uh, hello, Susanna, and I think also we did have Philippe, but we got Dom, and Dom as well. Oh, yep. all right, great. Philippe, so have... is on, Philippe is on a phone, so and my camera for some reason is not working, so I apologize. So uh, Philippe is on the phone, so he might have to drop because its battery has run out. I don't know if Dom, can you can you answer the question? Sure, we already have a bunch of things on the um, on the ISA repo available for this type of work, both on the side of the context and the schema definitions. So maybe I can guide you uh, at some point through the through the things that are already available on the GitHub repo of the ISA uh, tool. Okay, great. Thank you, ISA people. Sure. You're welcome. <laughs> we're we're big fans of the ISA people. They've they've helped us a lot. Yeah, we've, uh, we've already had a lot of contact with the within that project. So yeah, if you if you need help with this, you know where to contact us. Okay, thanks. Um, but but in general, would this be the approach to using uh, custom vocabulary terms? Is to put them in the context. That's what we've done, and we have several context files for each of the schemas. So we have Obo. Uh, we also have started the schema.org. So rather than starting oh, from scratch, you can oh. already take all of the context files that we've developed, and you have a base to work from. That's great. I'm going to drop. I'm just going to drop quickly um, um, a link for you in the in the chat. Okay. And there's a couple of other things that have popped up in the chat too from Simon and also Stian. Which All right, there's grab, nothing... grab those two. Sorry. There's nothing else that wacky that we're doing in the in the files right now. Everything else is pretty standard. So I don't know if I want to take up any more time with this. Um, as you guys know, we're we've struggled Maybe with could, how to could you share the actual file somewhere as well? Or can we just download it from the website? So we can, uh, I can, can I drop it in the chat? Yes, Dan wants to play with your file. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, want, I want to give it to Peter's visual, visualizer tool. Would it be okay to just email you um, the uh, presentation and some sample packages? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can link them in afterwards. That would be perfect, Abigail, because then everybody's raring to go on your um, on your examples here. <laughs> oh no, um, that yeah, I'll, I'll pick some good examples of of a variety of different packages to send you guys. We we still don't have a good solution for representing those file types. 
um, I, I was sort of biased toward having them in the RO crate metadata, but there's actually no specific reason that they need to be. Our original custom solution, we, we had those file type definitions in their own separate JSON files. So that's an option too. I, I think that it's much probably much better to just put them in as their separate uh, their own separate JSON file. Uh, partly because the um, then you can just use the frictionless tools on them. So we've yeah, that's inspired, true. By, yeah. inspired by comments from you um, a few months ago, we've started to do this on the language project that we're working on and we've just started testing it and documenting it. So we're putting this putting the schema files into every every crate that we have. So we've got things stored in RO crate format in a, in a repository. And in some cases that might be several several hundred or several thousand um, interviews or something from a language study. And we're gonna put the schema into each one so that you've got this, RO crate actually is on the side of redundancy in this. Uh, so that if you download, if you download an individual crate, you'll have the schema that applies. But mm -hmm. also we've defined, we've given it a name, which is unique to the repository so there's a bit of indirection there. There's a descriptor. I've put I've put this in the notes for today and linked to our profile. So it's in the it's in the agenda document. Yeah, it could also be linked to the profile. If we have an explicit profile, then that could be more verbose and have all of this listed, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we're using conforms to 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 link to the schema. I think it seems like the simplest thing to do. You just say this CSV file conforms to uh, a, a frictionless table schema. And then that's linked to uh, an actual file, but it could be okay. that you don't have to have that redundancy. If you, I mean, if you've got a reliable system and you trust it, you could just link to a, a schema that's on the web somewhere. But to make things easy, if someone downloads a zip file with the contents of a of an actual object in it, having this having the schema file in there with it, they can just use the frictionless tools to start doing things with it without having to fetch anything. I think that's the best thing, Peter, actually, because I think, you know, then then you're solid, aren't you? It's robust. And yeah. also, I think the separation of the files means that you end up with a separation of concerns. And I think that's yeah. really a powerful thing yeah. to do. And, and this also helps any versioning issues, because if someone goes and edit the file type, right, you don't want the older the new file yeah, type. In the yeah, 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 yeah. So just one other comment about um, the frictionless it the we haven't we haven't really explored this in in great detail yet but uh the the link there that you've shown a few times is, it has this rdf type link and that the definition for that says it should link to an rdf class and it's not that's actually a bit i mean if you took that seriously that's a bit restrictive we want to sometimes link to uh, a defined term or sometimes yeah, you value, value and it's not clear whether it's not making a distinction between the what the header is. So the header might be a property. So you might want to say this field is a property, and the value is a uh, is a type scheme of person, for example. Um, there's a reason they did it that simply because I think they they were kind of refugees from the CSV on the web ontology discussions and decided that that was all too hard. So you said there's a limit to how far you can take these things, but you can put whatever you like in that table schema. So that's that's extensible. There's, it, it says clearly that in the def, you, definition, you can put whatever you, you can add additional terms. So we might want to add from the RO crate world, we might want to recommend people use things like RDF property or define term as as values in that, uh, in that schema. Once we explore whether those things are valuable, to have a little bit more precision about what it is you're describing. So are your files primarily uh, tabular data files? Um, not well, the language data, I mean, a lot of it starts with text. So I've been playing text or something marked up in XML or audio, but, and then they get transcriptions in various formats. So CSV transcriptions are fairly popular. We found ingesting data, language data sets. So they're, they're, ta they're tabular uh, and they're quite simple. Um, but a lot of the vocabulary around scientific data doesn't fit. I mean, these are these are transcriptions of things that people are saying. And then there are some more specific formats, which are really complicated XML 
things that are multi-tiered. Yeah. So you might you so you know we which we haven't tackled yet, but you might have a video and you might have a if somebody's speaking in um, Tagalog or something, and then you have a trans a transcription in that language, a translation into English, tagging down to the phonemes or phonetic information on I mean, multiple streams of data. So yeah, we haven't got to that, but people do use CSV quite a bit. So that's that's another challenge for us as to how do we how do we define non-tabular data files? Do we bastardize the frictionless framework and just go ahead and define the field descriptors anyway? But we have the same problem that not not everything is is tabular. So if you if you guys start working on that problem, I'd be interested in yeah, yeah. Well, maybe the There's first query is like you did where you just make an identifier for that format and then it's not described any further but at least you can link multiple occurrences of it yeah there's a few sort of level of sameness yes so I, I think we might do that but it, it depends on whether the um there's any value in it one, one of the features of the the, the ELAN file format, which is widely used by linguists and people doing transcriptions, is they just do their own thing, right? And and those communities are a long way from having any standardization in anything that they do. So it may not be worth it if you, if if everything is you know sets of two files, the the work of doing the schema might not be mm -hmm. right. be worth it. But we can we'll, we will we will it's an open discussion in our project. So I'll let you know if we if we tackle that. We we are uh, on our end slightly uh, trying to to play with those things. By uh, our our approach up to now has been focusing on on RDF. So what we are doing is any format we have, we try to uplift it into RDF, and then uh, use very what we call them named queries to. Uh, uh, identify sparkle statements with parameters that then will extract new tables out of it and then uh, this up to now gives us the most flexibility in, in mopping just anything into a knowledge graph and then subtracting knowledge from it again uh, because people wanting to do analysis they don't want to deal with knowledge graphs they just want to deal with data frames and, and that's what a, a standard Sparkle query will, will give you. It will give you a, a tabular format, which is pretty much uh, exportable as, or, or accessible as a data frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is, well, it's it's more conceptually. It's, it's the various files we are getting into. We're a little bit like Peter is, is uh, or uh, Peter or Stian, I, I forgot, was saying, you, are, you give an identifier to just say, okay, this is, our kind of thing, and we put it in, in our profile, and then we associate a very specific way of uplifting that into uh, the knowledge graph. And then on the other hand, we have our named queries to retract information out of it. But that's, that's for us, the most flexible way is kind of always going to the knowledge graph and then coming, pulling back uh, information out of it. Also, when you discussed the, the, frictionless or, or or tabular or whatever we kind of taken the approach it'll it'll be anything anyhow so whatever yeah. comes up to us try and find an easy mechanism to getting into a knowledge graph connected to all the other bits and then extract information you, out of it again but if you're not going to query something you're not too bothered about putting it up there right they can Excuse me? if you're not going to query some part of the data then you can just leave it in the native format right yeah 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 yeah. absolutely on the other hand well you i i mentioned this last time the the, the other thing we're also looking into is having these fragmentations of your uh of your knowledge graph published as uh, single addressable items that can you know can be queried uh in in a in a federated way but that's work further down the road. Yeah. We're dealing with the legacy mark of somebody doing half of that job that you're talking about on the language data. So they turned it into RDF, being computer scientists and thought it was useful in that form. And then nobody in the community, in the research community knew what to do with it. So it's kind of just kind of got left. 
I, I, I absolutely, of having I absolutely the agree. I absolutely agree. It, it, it keeps on depending on on the, is is the metadata or or at least somebody around capable of understanding what is in there and bridging the gap, yeah, br bridging the gap to 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 uplifting the, to 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 semantics. Are those people still available, uh, or, or did they do a good job back in the day? Mm. Um, yeah. But I, I agree. <laughs> there's there's still a lot of data out there that just is. I think all all the stuff That's Abigail was showing is uh, the examples you were giving are pretty much like the 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 same horror show we we're all facing. Uh, somebody wrote down something in a file and assumed that whatever was going on in his head was going to be totally clear to somebody else at a later stage. Yeah. And yeah. guess what? It didn't. <laughs> but it's the best effort. So thank you, Abigail, for showing us that. That was yeah. quite inspiring, especially seeing the kind of cross-domain discussion coming out of this here. Right? It doesn't have to all be biosamples it's, or LinkedIn. I wanted to bring Florian in if you're on the line, because you also had some thoughts before on ISAR in our brain. Is there something you want to add to this? Um uh, no, actually, uh, it was very interesting to see how how uh, uh, you approach this, Abigail. Uh, just uh, I'm here, so I, I got some input, some ideas for for our project. Uh, yeah, but but uh, from my side, uh, n nothing to add or to ask. Uh, just just interesting to learn more. <laughs> but thanks for the talk. Thank you. Right. Carol, something you want to add? Yeah, I just popped in a couple of things into the notes that um, there's some work on RO crates and um, uh, ISA going to be happening in the biohackathon, the European biohackathon. So, and there's a project on that. So, I just popped that in. That's led by Stuart uh, Stian um, to do with plants and my appy and the representation of my appy data in isa and uh, so that that was very interesting and um, there was something else i i remembered as well that was happening in, oh yes yeah, samples so i noticed that you had a lot of work on samples there abigail and uh, and jake and there's a samples working group currently running at the moment uh, uh, with bios bio samples and various other people working in the samples arena, people at MIT, people at PNNL, um, people in various different places about figuring out how we do with samples. So I just put a link in there um, into the notes that you might be interested in joining that. And there's a lot of RO crateness going on there. So um, they're all people who are kind of working in the same sort of arena. So I think this is coming together, right? There's, I can see ley lines lining up here there's a lot of interest around around this and and that's great to hear because we're both abigail and i you know in our own spheres have really been evangelizing those standards i just gave a, a talk at a google research group today about about that same stuff like use our rates use isa use ontologies yeah it, it, it's all it's all lining it's very nice in fact uh, the um p isa people um, who have built a whole sort of set of libraries based on ISA and file systems. They're also part of, of that. I don't know if you've heard of P-ISA. I will see if I could dig out the, the information. Um, so there's a, there's a whole bunch of folks coming together on this. This, this is, looks very, very, very nice. And I've sent out a whole bunch of messages to people who couldn't be here today. So I think this has got legs, uh, Stian, this, this work. Very much. And I'm yeah, very glad, thrilled, glad to, thrilled to, to see it. Yeah. To kind of finally bringing together the research object and ISA world. I, I, yeah, I want to say the same thing. Before, like, yeah. <laughs> I want to echo what Carol said. It's great that it's coming together. Yeah. 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 You wrote and a it's paper coming about together by the ago. users, right? So it's not theoretical, this is practical use cases, right? Yeah, yeah. And I also like that. You know, things like the partial overlap, of course, would be partial overlap. Otherwise, yeah. there wouldn't be any point to link them. Yeah, like Carol will say, Carol, we did this paper with the Giga Science ages ago, but then it was only like an example, a prototype of the very early research objects, if you remember. And then, yeah, so it's fantastic to see progressing.
I think particularly the frictionless data yeah. angle is really powerful. So the combination of frictionless data and RO crate, I think, is a very powerful combination. So I'm I'm very excited about this, Abigail. That's Jay. that's really good to hear. Yeah. Great. So we should try to write this up as a use case. We can fill it on our website. Yes. We have all the material <laughs> there in a the minute. It's just to compress it in. <laughs> I already managed to squeeze it in into my slides at uh, the Elixir or Hands. I show I, I added a little logo up there, uh, Abigail, about Jackson. So um, we've already oh, started. Cool. Uh, we've already started selling your stuff, uh, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, but um, I, I think there's a lot here to sell. I think this is really, there's a lot here, a lot of opportunity here to have a big impact in, in quite a few projects with this approach. Excellent. Well, we're very grateful to all of you and the work that you've done to, to lay down the, the foundation for it. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sure. We have five minutes left, so I think you kind of covered the point you mentioned, Peter, here on the language data commons. You know, it's mostly what you described, right? So, did you say you've changed something in the draft as well? You're going to try this with you. Uh, uh, nothing in the draft. We're just, I'm still just putting things in the issue. Yeah. Uh, I think if we can come up with patterns that people are happy with, we can talk about this approach. And also, there's the thing that um, science on schema that all people do using defined terms or whatever they say that. Yeah. The, um, the, there's their approach, which um, so we can we can give a couple of options. I think is best we can do. There's no one way to do this. Okay. Let's see some link about comps. That's a Barcelona thing, right? The reference system. Yeah, I did some more promoting of um, RO Crate, and uh, Laura and uh, Jose Maria were there and supported me. And then Jose Maria took me to dinner. It was very nice. <laughs> um so um so i wanted to um yeah and then i went on the saturday i um went partying with Marseille. do you remember Marseille from dataverse and uh so she's um she's sent her wishes to everybody and um we pointed out to um senior people in the barcelona supercomputer center that Marseille is a author of the ro crate paper and Marseille is now Secretary for um, Open Data in the Catalan government, open government, that's it, for the, in the Catalan government. So, so we actually have a politician as an author of the RO Crate. Hey, Peter, it, it, exciting, it, huh? It, it, it is, it's such a small world because I, I just sat and had dinner with Marseille, I don't know, a month or so oh. ago in, <laughs> in states with a bunch of astrophysicists. There you go. So you see, she's, a very small ways. She's an old friend of mine too, Jake. Yeah. So yeah, I got I got so nice. I got to hang out um at her house, which is awesome. Her bedroom cool. same has the same footprint as my entire house. <laughs> she, I saw some pictures of it while we were eating oysters it's, together. Yeah, it's a thousand place. year old fort yeah. on the top yeah. of a hill. It's yeah. just awesome. Anyway, Merce wishes me to say hello to everybody and um and send her regards. And I'm just delighted to have a politician as an author of um, of a technical paper. Yeah. Who knew? All right. But we had Thank a great you. time, didn't we, guys? Yeah, Laura and Jose Maria, we had a great time. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> we have been pinging the Dataverse people. So that's something to follow up again. It would uh, be good to follow after up. After the yeah. summer, yeah. Yeah, let's follow up the data first, people. Yeah. Another thing to follow up, but I don't know if it was you or Mark who put in the profile registry. Uh, yes, I did. Talk briefly about it, but then we lost track and we have to. I haven't forgotten. Very quickly, That's why I put it back quickly. in. The profile registry is is important. I think we need to start working yeah. on that. Yeah. And uh, Danny had promised to have a look at it as well after yeah. I had given him enough bear at uh, Skipple Airport. So that's it from for me. So anything else people want to add? Do we Back have anything? Was the ball is over now. Yeah, come on, Carol. <laughs> yeah, Zenodo. Uh, while we're talking about the data, yeah. where do we stand on Zenodo? I'm 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 totally confused. Well, we lost 
we lost the person that was meant to do it, right? So I don't know if he's he's still on sick leave, isn't he? So. But are there any other angles? Because we need to pick yeah. that up again, because uh, the node is important, particularly. Um, yeah, the from... second angle is is the GitHub action approach where we push in, right? That's the more low key version, right? And we have uh, uh, my colleague uh, Gerard is looking a bit at GitHub action. He's trying out your thing, Mark. So if you're getting questions from him, that's because of that. We're trying to put together a kind of tutorial of how to do different things with our creating GitHub actions. But, there are some... but, but I think there's a project link you want to bring up, Carol, right? Well, I want to bring up somebody specifically who is working in Zenodo, see if we can start, because I know we were originally working with Martin, but, um, but there are other people working in Zenodo. So I'm wondering if we can, we can, we can drive it through a different route. Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy called Tim, isn't there? I'm trying to remember his surname. I'm blanking on it. Anybody can help me? I'll dig it out. Yeah, we'll dig it out. Um, because, yeah, okay, so I, I'm thinking that we, one of the things I really want to push in the next uh, few months is really getting the Zenodo stuff nailed down. Because that's a, if you can get, if you can flip data person Zenodo, then I think that's, then you're doing pretty good. Anybody got friends with Pigshare? Yes, of course, Mark. Mark is an old friend. He's the founder of Figshare. Yeah, I know him too. But... Yeah, we could we could email him. Manchester Manchester's a paying customer, right? Sorry. We're paying customers and um... oh, okay, so that's what he needs to hear, because I've raised this with him before and he's he was polite as always, but said, you know, this these feature requests have to come from from customers. Uh, well, okay. We are a customer. We should ask. Well, we are customers. Like we're a very, very expensive customer, <laughs> or they're, they're expensive, and we pay a lot of money. Okay. Point taken. Thank you, Peter. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. That's it. So the next calls, uh, we'll skip the next one for one call because the Europeans are on holiday. So the next one will be. See her. Sorry, Steve, what was that Zenodo thing about? Uh, yeah, go on. So, sorry, what, what, what was the Zenodo thing about having Zenodo generate auto creeds? Well, it's what yeah. import and export, yeah. Mm. Yes. Right. Okay. Mainly, mainly think about export, I think. Yeah. We keep getting a, a close good, to well, it. A good start would be if, if somebody deposits a crate, it being able to do, do something with the auto crate yeah, metadata. Yeah. Yeah, because at the moment, you know, there's no, you can't see a preview. Even if you added the preview, it won't show you an HTML file. No, it's, and there's a problem as weird. well is that any compound object in Sonata have absolutely no description of its content, right? Yeah. So just getting something that would allow you to deposit the RO crate alongside the normal, yeah. the other methods. Yeah, they have uh, security reason why they don't normally render the HTML, right? But if yeah, it but was they an could, HTML they, they had it. rendered, it, they could show it, right? Maybe we could find someone who can write a renderer which is compatible with their platform. So, you know, yeah, if yeah, it's built into their platform, it can render the uh, Arrow Crate. Yeah, JSON. I looked at that render code and it's, it's fairly trivial, actually. It's almost like an iframe kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Tim Smith. Tim Smith. As soon as I eventually found it. Okay, so Tim Smith is in the Zenodo family, isn't he? So maybe we should start tackling yeah. start tackling some people who are actually working on the Zenodo program, you know, who are part of the development team. Yeah, we have some pro EU projects also involved with them, right? So that we can push those. Yeah. Dan yeah. Daniel yeah. about will be know more about that. There's the, also the okay. EOS uh, um, enterprise file system stuff where we work on Describo is pushing into Zenodo. So that's Monster University. You have to push from both ends, from top and bottom, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I'm just I'm just right. flagging. No, no in the windows of our princess uh, in I'm just I'm just flagging that I'm really going to try pressing the generalist repositories um big time on in, in the next um uh few months. So, um, uh, and particularly with the NIH program coming up, 
you know, where um, today was the, um, uh, uh, the, it's just been released this, this uh, whole set of papers about how we change culture that came out of the NIH uh, workshop on, on, uh, on that preparing for the um, big 2023 flip of um, everything's going to be open. So, and I think the generalist repositories will be come incredibly important. So we need to, to really see if we can get embedded with those. Just digging, just digging if out. you find a link for that, and then we can close the call. Okay. Susanna, Thank I, I, thanks for putting the link to that uh, to that recipe, the ISA um, RO crate, because we use that as a resource too. And I, yeah, you already done it. <laughs> okay, if there's no something problem. you want to add to it, I think there's a link for adding suggestions as well. Yes, absolutely. Recipe. If you want to expand the recipe, you add more. Yeah, absolutely. Philippe is always the content there. Make sure we put those into the notes as well before we lose the chat. Okay, good. Loads of cool stuff today. All right, very Thank good. you for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. See you next month. Excellent much. work. Thank you. Very. I'm inspired. We good. are too. Right, I'm okay. off to have some tacos. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.